nothing. He's a nothing. He's a pervert from hell. But all these years, I said, once they kill, they don't stop. He had no right to kill my daughter. On March 10th, 1991, in the heart of Nashville, Tennessee, a trail of shattered lives and unanswered questions unfolded. The lifeless body of Pamela Rose McCall, a 33-year-old woman, was discovered near a wooded knoll Saturn Parkway by a passing motorist. Despite extensive efforts, the investigation into her death yielded no leads or answers. For three decades, the circumstances surrounding her demise remained a mystery, leaving her loved ones and investigators searching for elusive clues. What would be the cause of her death? How did the investigators finally solve the case? Welcome back to Real Crime Storytime, where we cover solved, unsolved, and mysterious cases from across the globe. Today, we delve into the disturbing case of Pamela Rose Aldridge McCall, which was solved by a shopping cart in 2020. But first, if you still haven't subscribed to our channel, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the bell icon below as it motivates us to create more intriguing content for you. So without further ado, let's dive right into this mystery. Nashville, the capital of Tennessee, is a vibrant city, known for its rich musical heritage and cultural allure, home to the iconic Grand Old Opry and the legendary Music Row, Nashville beckons music lovers from around the world. The city's vibrant downtown area is adorned with honky-tonks and live music venues, offering a lively atmosphere. Beyond its musical roots, Nashville boasts historic landmarks, diverse culinary experiences, and a thriving art scene. With its southern charm and hospitable spirit, Nashville continues to captivate visitors and residents alike. This city has held the mystery of murder of a young woman for 30 long years. But first, let's start where it all began. Born in the city of Cedar Rapids in 1958, Pamela Rose Aldridge McCall hailed from a family deeply rooted in Iowa. As the cherished daughter of Marsha Ray Lyle, Pamela entered the world when her mother was just 17 years old. No information about her father is available. Growing up, Pamela enjoyed the company of her four brothers, forming a tight-knit bond. With a large extended family surrounding her, Pamela experienced the warmth and support of a close network. As life unfolded, Pamela's path led her to Virginia, where she embarked on her educational journey. Attending Middlesex High School, she faced unique challenges but remained determined. Although she left school at the age of 16, Pamela's thirst for knowledge led her to explore nursing school briefly, embracing the potential for a fulfilling career in healthcare. Pamela, a joyful and carefree spirit, was known for her spontaneous adventures and love for hitchhiking. She had a kind and respectful nature, treating everyone with care and consideration. In her early 20s, Pamela found love and married a truck driver named Stephen Grace from Pennsylvania. Their love story blossomed as they welcomed a precious baby boy into their lives. However, Pamela's free-spirited nature made it challenging for her to settle down. The constraints of a traditional life proved difficult for her to bear, and she longed for the freedom to follow her own path. The demands of raising a child always necessitate stability but with Stephen's occupation as a truck driver, it kept him away for extended periods, and they faced the challenge of providing their son with the care he needed. As a result, the responsibility of raising their child fell largely upon his paternal grandparents, who lovingly stepped in to offer their support. Despite Pamela and Stephen's best efforts, eventually their marriage ended in divorce. After the divorce, Pamela began life on her own, and in 1991, she was living independently, looking ahead to her future. But little did she know that the future was one that she would never get to see. On March 2, 1991, 
Marsha Lyle engaged in a conversation with her beloved daughter, Pamela. She laughed and talked joyfully over the payphone in Tennessee. Blissfully unaware of the impending tragedy, Pamela assured her mother that she would be home in a few days. Little did they know that this seemingly ordinary conversation would be their final exchange. One quiet afternoon on March 10th, 1991, the Spring Hill Police Department received an urgent call. A passerby motorist came across what he thought was a sleeping woman, but upon closer inspection, it turned out to be a motionless, almost naked body of an adult female. The discovery took place near Saturn Parkway, close to Interstate 65, specifically near the off-ramp for Port Royal Road. This location was about 40 miles south of the lively city of Nashville. As law enforcement rushed to the location amidst the wood line, they found the body of a Caucasian woman. The chilling aspect of the discovery was unsettling. The manner in which the victim was positioned seemed almost deliberate, as if the perpetrator had taken pride in displaying his heinous act. Upon searching the whole area, the investigators didn't find any identification or personal belongings of the victim nearby. They quickly deduced that the location where her remains were found was not the site of her untimely demise. Her clothing showed signs of being torn, with her garments in a state of disarray. Tragically, visible injuries marred her face and neck, which indicated a violent encounter. After meticulously documenting the evidence at the scene, the authorities transported the body to the medical examiner's office for a thorough autopsy. Her fingerprints were collected and cross-referenced in the system, which resulted in a positive identification. Through this crucial step, they confirmed that the victim was Pamela Rose McCall. The identification provided investigators with a starting point to delve deeper into her life and potential connections. Upon the completion of the autopsy, investigators were met with a shocking revelation. It was discovered that Pamela had been 24 weeks pregnant at the time of her death. The medical examiner's report determined that she had been strangled and her neck was broken, which had led to her demise. Disturbingly, the state of her clothing and garments strongly indicated the possibility of violence, suggesting that Pamela may have been assaulted before being murdered. To gather further evidence, the torn clothing and garments were sent to a forensics laboratory for thorough examination. After the examination, they found some bodily fluid on the pantyhose that she had been wearing. From that fluid, a DNA sample was successfully recovered, which was believed could be the DNA of the killer. The recovered DNA sample was then sent to the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation. However, due to the limited advancements in DNA technology in 1991, lab technicians were unable to find a match. The sample they had was too small, and law enforcement databases were not as extensive as they are today. Recognizing the potential for future technological developments, the DNA, along with the clothing and other evidence, was carefully preserved in a secure container. During their investigation, investigators diligently sought out potential suspects. They approached people in the vicinity where Pamela McCall's body was discovered, asking people if they had noticed anything unusual between the time of her last known sighting and the discovery of her body. However, the information gathered was limited. Witnesses mentioned that Pamela had been traveling with a truck driver. Several individuals recalled seeing Pamela at a truck stop a few days before her body was found on March 10, 1991. At the time, she had been engaged in a heated conversation with a driver of a semi-truck. Unfortunately, none of the witnesses could provide detailed descriptions of the truck or the driver, which made it challenging for investigators to narrow down their search to a specific suspect. The lead detective in Pamela's case, Spring Hill Police Captain Ron Coleman, explained that having a definite suspect at that time was crucial. The DNA sample they had was too small, and replicating it for analysis would have destroyed the original sample. Instead, a decision was made to wait for technology to advance further and provide better opportunities for investigation. Unfortunately, 
This meant the case gradually went cold, with no significant breakthroughs in the investigation. As the years went by after her daughter's death, with no further leads in the case, Marsha Lyle struggled to cope with the pain of her loss. In 2007, she moved from her Gloucester, Virginia home to another house, in part to get away from the sad thoughts, but she was never at peace, waiting for Pamela's killer to be found. In 2019, patrolman Ty Hadley of the Spring Hill Police Department stumbled upon a book that sparked an unexpected conversation. The book, titled In the Name of the Children, was found on a desk in the office of his colleague and evidence technician manager, Melissa Wilson. Even though Hadley wasn't really into true crime, he unexpectedly showed an interest in solving a cold case. He found the idea quite thrilling. Upon hearing this, Melissa revealed that their department actually had such a case with a lot of evidence. Little did they know that their conversation would play a crucial role in the investigation of a nearly three-decade-old homicide case within their jurisdiction. The investigation was reopened in 2019, and being curious to delve into the details of this case, Hadley and Melissa visited the Detective Criminal Investigation Division closet at the back of the police department. They discovered a comprehensive case file filled with extensive notes, initial autopsy reports, crime scene photographs, and various paperwork. The file also contained forms from the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, or TBI, indicating earlier attempts to gather evidence. Hadley was taken aback by the size of the file, but remained determined to uncover the truth, and he meticulously studied its contents. Little did he know he was about to deal with Pamela McCall's murder case. For their investigation... Hadley and Wilson proceeded to the department's evidence room located at City Hall. There, they retrieved a box containing crucial pieces of evidence from Pamela's case. Among the items carefully preserved were the torn clothing worn by the victim, her pantyhose, clippings from her fingernails, and the enigmatic DNA sample. Each item held the potential to shed light on the mysterious circumstances surrounding the case. Their investigation led them to gather gas station records from different truck stops in the Nashville area at the time of Pamela's death in 1991. Given that Pamela's body was found near Nashville and she was last seen with a trucker, the investigators believed that the trucker would have stopped at a gas station in the time frame around her death. While they didn't have anything specific to compare the records to at that moment, they understood the significance of having this information on hand for future reference. Despite lacking substantial evidence to progress their investigation, the investigators redirected their attention to the mysterious DNA sample recovered from the victim's clothing. In 2019, they decided to send the DNA sample to the Wyoming Forensic Department for testing, hoping that advancements in technology would yield new insights and potentially lead them closer to solving the case. The lab entered the DNA sample in the national database and it resulted in a match with a suspect involved in numerous other murder cases. The nature of these deaths shared similarities with the murder of Pamela McCall. Further investigation led to the identification of the suspect as Clark Perry Baldwin from Tennessee. Clark Baldwin the suspect in the case, had a diverse background. He was raised in Nashua, Iowa, and completed his education at Nashua Plainfield High School in 1979. As an adult, he resided in various towns, including Nashua, Missouri, Waterloo, Virginia, Newport News, and Springfield. Baldwin worked as a long-haul trucker for Martin Transport for several years, including during the time period when the murder took place in the 1990s. After Baldwin's career as a long-haul trucker in the 1990s, he settled in Newport News, Virginia, where he started working as a taxi driver for the Orange Cab Company. Baldwin was also in a relationship with Rochelle Bourbonmoyer, who already had five children. They got married in December 1987. However, their marriage was troubled, 
and they got divorced shortly afterward. According to Bob and Moyer's daughter, Jamie Jones, now 43 years old, who lived with Baldwin from ages 3 to 6, her experience with him was far from positive. She stated that all five children in the family suffered from Baldwin's mistreatment. In 1991, Baldwin was arrested and charged with assaulting a 21-year-old woman in Wheeler County, Texas. The victim reported being held at gunpoint while hitchhiking and subjected to physical violence. Baldwin confessed to the crime during questioning by investigators. However, before the grand jury hearing, the victim disappeared, making it impossible to proceed with the case. Prosecutors decided to drop the charges against Baldwin due to the lack of the victim's testimony. This incident was not the last time Baldwin's name was linked to criminal activities. In 1997, Baldwin was involved in a more straightforward legal case that led to his imprisonment. The Secret Service received information that Baldwin was producing counterfeit US currency using his personal computer. After confirming the tip's validity, agents obtained a search warrant for Baldwin's residence in Springfield, Missouri. They then conducted a raid, which resulted in the arrest of Baldwin and two female associates. Baldwin was charged with counterfeiting and subsequently was sentenced to 18 months in jail. He was later released in 1999. Following his release, Baldwin remained off the investigator's radar until recent developments in the murder case of Pamela. In a surprising turn of events, investigators discovered that there were two other cases in Wyoming from March and April 1990 bore similarities with Pamela's case. One of these cases involved Barbara Leverton, who found the frozen body of a naked, white female at a lay-by near Bitter Creek, Wyoming, on March 1, 1992. She alerted the authorities, who concluded that the body had been thrown from a westbound vehicle on the highway. The unidentified female victim was later named Bitter Creek Betty, and her time of death was estimated to be between October 1991 and February 1992. Despite efforts to establish her identity, even fingerprints and facial recognitions yielded no new leads. The medical examiner determined that she had been strangled and potentially assaulted. Additionally, no missing persons reports matched her description, leaving her identity a mystery. DNA extracted from her clothing was believed to belong to the perpetrator, who likely had type O blood. The investigators also focused on her rose tattoo, and traced it back to a Tucson tattoo parlor near the Triple T truck stop. They conducted some interviews which yielded limited information, and even hypnosis of the tattoo artist provided no significant leads. The identity of the victim remained unknown, and the case unsolved. With the investigation at a standstill, Bitter Creek Betty was buried in an unmarked grave at Rest Haven Memorial Gardens in Rock Springs, Wyoming. Six weeks after the discovery of Bitter Creek Betty's body on April 13, 1992, highway workers found another female victim in a barrow ditch near Sheridan County. The fully clothed victim had no obvious cause of death, and the area provided no clues for identification. The remains were taken to the medical examiner's office, where her fingerprints were taken and sent for analysis. The medical examiner estimated her time of death to be in February 1992, with cause of death being blunt force trauma to the head. The autopsy also indicated that she was also assaulted. Despite fingerprint checks and searches in missing persons databases, her identity remained unknown, leading to her being called Sheridan County Jane Doe, or I-90 Jane Doe. A profile was created to help identify the victim, including a reconstructed image. Investigators released her description as a Caucasian female, approximately 5 foot 5 or 5 foot 6 inches tall, weighing around 110 to 115 pounds, with dark brown eyes. Despite efforts, her identity was never revealed, and the case remained unsolved. She was later buried as Sheridan County Jane Doe in Rock Springs, Wyoming. In April 2020, Investigators made a significant breakthrough when they located Baldwin, now 58 years old, residing in Waterloo, Iowa. 
However, before proceeding with an arrest, they needed to confirm that the DNA evidence found on Pamela's clothing indeed matched Baldwin's. To gather concrete evidence, state and federal officials embarked on a covert operation. For ten days, they put Baldwin's apartment under surveillance and closely monitored his activities. One morning, Baldwin visited a local Walmart store and retrieved a shopping cart after he left. The FBI discreetly gathered the DNA samples from the shopping cart that he used. Additionally, they seized various items discarded by Baldwin outside his apartment, including a peach can, orange peelings, and a soda. These items were carefully collected as potential evidence in their ongoing investigation. Then, without any delay, the investigators submitted the evidence in May 2020 to the lab for analysis. When the result came back, they found a match between Baldwin's DNA and the DNA found at the crime scenes of the two murders in Wyoming during the 1990s. The DNA evidence also specifically linked Baldwin to the bodily fluid and other materials recovered from Pamela's case, confirming his connection to this case as well. On May 6, 2020, law enforcement officers from local, state, and federal agencies made a journey of approximately 700 miles from Spring Hill, Tennessee, to northeastern Iowa. Their destination was Baldwin's apartment, located on the sixth floor of an eight-floor building. They also informed Lyrell, Pamela's mother, that they were going to arrest the killer. She first thought that they were joking, but when the investigators explained the whole investigation, a sense of relief washed over her. During the interrogation at his apartment, which lasted for several hours, Baldwin revealed that he had been married in 1990, but was having an affair with Pamela, and she was carrying his child at the time of her murder. Prior to her body being discovered on March 10, 1991, they were travelling together when they got into an argument, leading Pamela to leave the truck in frustration. Baldwin admitted to then killing Pamela and leaving her body on Saturn Parkway in Nashville. After his arrest on May 6, 2020, at his apartment in Waterloo, Iowa, Baldwin faced charges for the murders of Pamela Rose McCall and her unborn baby. The bond was set at a staggering $1 million. Later, on May 15, 2020, Baldwin was extradited to the Maury County Jail in Tennessee. He awaited his trial, which was scheduled for either December 2020 or January 2021. During the arraignment, Judge David Allen appointed an attorney for Baldwin's case and scheduled a settlement date for September 8, 2020, according to Count Clark Sandy McLean. Baldwin is currently in custody at Maury County Jail, with a bond set at $1 million. In addition to the charges for the murders of Pamela and her unborn baby, Baldwin was anticipated to face charges for the other two murders in Wyoming. However, at present... No further information has been disclosed by the police regarding these additional charges. The investigation continues and updates may follow as more details unfold. The satisfaction of finally solving this long unsolved case was immeasurable. It serves as a testament to the power of collaboration among law enforcement agencies nationwide. Chief Bright, who has been leading the department since 2010, expressed his gratitude for the joint efforts that led to this breakthrough. He emphasised the importance of good old-fashioned police work, which played a crucial role in bringing the truth to light. At 78 years old, Pamela's mother, residing in Virginia, carried the weight of her daughter's tragic loss. He's nothing. He's nothing. He's a pervert from hell. He's just like the devil. I don't know how many women he's killed, but all these years, I said, once they kill, they don't stop. He had no right to kill my daughter. She was seven months pregnant when he killed her. If she would have lived three hours, I'd had a beautiful granddaughter. Throughout the years, she held on to the hope that her daughter's killer would be brought to justice and face the ultimate punishment, the death penalty. When Gertz, the officer, called her on the day of Baldwin's arrest, 
he delivered the long-awaited news. Overwhelmed with a mix of emotions, Pamela's mother's reaction was a powerful blend of relief, sorrow, and gratitude. In that moment, she found solace in the belief that God had blessed everyone involved in the case. This case is an example of the achievement that showcases the remarkable results that can be achieved when the law enforcement work together towards a common goal. What are your thoughts on this case? Was justice truly served for Pamela's murder? We'd love to hear from you. Also, if there's a case that you'd like us to cover, don't hesitate to drop your recommendations in the comments below. And don't forget to like, share and subscribe to our channel for more captivating true crime stories. Until next time, stay safe and keep your eyes peeled for the next mystery to unfold.